test things, right? They need to figure out what systems are working and what systems are not. Um, yes. Con congregate living is colleges, young people, but it is congregate living, and there are many places that have congregate living, such as you know, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. assisted living and prisons, and you know, uh, you know, recovery homes and things like that. And we right. need to figure out we need to figure out how to deal with them. So. I don't right. know, maybe you'll, maybe there'll be some good learning and good byproducts, maybe. Yeah, so. you never know. Hopefully right. everybody will be safe. So we have Nina. Hi, everyone. Um, so I don't think we have a quorum quite yet. I just have a quick question. I mean, this isn't, we don't need a quorum for this question. It might just be me. Did we get the minutes from, the, the minutes that I got were actually from June. Did anyone else find that? Yes, I'm sure that's exactly what you got. Okay, that's fine. I was just like, wait, did I, what month is it right now? <laughs> I don't even know. So, I was uh, so, I was so carefully reading through them going like, wow, this round sounds really familiar. Um, yeah. So that's fine. We, I mean, I can, we, that's okay. I just wanted to check. I, now now I, I have to find them. <laughs> losing my mind. No, 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 it's me. It's me. So, you know, that whole goal about sending out, I did send out perfectly correct minutes, just the wrong, mm -hmm. the wrong minutes. Yes. No, that's I, okay. I know, I, I know I saw them because I know Michelle sent them to me and, and I corrected them. <laughs> Not corrected. I edited, I edited them. I always say, like to say things like that. Oh yeah, I sent that out on purpose just to see if you were reading it, right? <laughs> yep, we were checking. I'll just kind of see if I can find anything, and I'll make sure those get out. It looks like a pretty uh, a pretty short meeting. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I know I definitely did these minutes. Yep. Lordy Lordy knows where they are. How are things with you, Nina? They're good. Just very hot. <laughs> Work are you in no air conditioning is are, are you in Reading or are you in Gloucester I'm in Reading and it's really hot and it's hard working from home when it's really hot <laughs> it's like a test of endurance <laughs> not complaining I mean I'm lucky to be able to work from home but it has been a hot couple weeks <laughs> I don't think it's going to get better for a few days yeah, I don't think so either. <laughs> I don't know who's suffering more, me or my cats, with their long hair. Yep, it has the right date, but the wrong, wrong, correct date, but the wrong content. Oh, I'm so clever. I'm so clever. I just trick myself all the time. All right, we'll fix on that tomorrow. Note to self. All right, let's see here. So now I know John, John had another um, meeting that was around okay. this time that was, you know, not a regularly scheduled thing. Um, I know that Monette and you were on vacation um, this week and have said that they were able to do it this 
may be able to join, but I'm not sure. Okay. I'm having, you're breaking up a little, Nina. Oh, sorry, am I? Yeah. Now, now you're good. There you go. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, he said he maybe he would be able to join from Maine, but I'm not sure, you know, if um, what, what's going on with that. Because I have, I have his, I have Deb Gilberg's, I have his wife's cell phone number, but I don't have Andrew's. Let me see if I can find it. Contact info. Oh, well, he has his home number. to be Lauren's most exciting trustee meeting of the lifetime. You won't have to worry about those minutes. I know. Uh, She's like, I'll volunteer anytime you want. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, is vehicle day, is that right? Yes, that is, that is. Well, I mean, we can talk, we just can't deliberate on anything. So um, the only, and I think the only thing that was up for deliberation, I don't know if there was deliberation, but you know, I provided some information about um, some expected expenses um, to purchase some things. So we can um, kind of skip that, but I can check in. And the um, Nina Monette's back next week. I can check in with you and Monette uh, just to see if there's any questions that you all have about that. Okay. Um, it doesn't re it doesn't require a vote. It's just one of those when things get over, when things are out outside the normal <laughs> scope of what we normally purchase. I try to um, just make sure everybody's on the same page. You know, to expect some of these things, so that when you do get the uh, the warrants, you're not like what. What is what's that all about? So, um, but yeah, tomorrow is vehicle day. They're doing a parade um, on a parade route. Um, and then um, we talked about, um, you know, we were curious whether we'd have to stop it because of Baker's reducing the exterior crowds, but I, they, they think it'll be okay because it won't be in one location. It's actually literally parading along. So, um, uh, Any other, anyone have informational questions I could answer? I can't think of anything. Neither can I. I guess we should probably just maybe give it another five minutes. Alice, are you up in Maine or are you in Reading? No, oh, actually we're back. We, uh, we spent all of July up in New York with my California son and his kids. So <laughs> we're back. Nice.
have you been up there lately, Amy, or no? Um, which we've been trying to take like um, little trips, little weekend trips. So we go, we quarantine there, we bring everything we can with us and right. sort of kind of get to get away from Reading for a little bit and then drive back. So um, yeah, we just we kind of joke like, geez, if you run out of whatever bananas and there's no bananas for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, is your place in Maine? Yeah, yeah, it's in Maine and it's in um, Bridgeton. So. You bought Bridgeton? Yeah. Is, is uh, Bridgeton the, um, well, which lake is in Bridgeton? Oh, it's on the high Sorry. end. Is which one? Can you say that again? No, which, which, what was the name of the lake again? Highland. Highland? Yes. I don't know that one. But that doesn't mean anything about a gazillion yeah. lakes in Maine. So. Now, are you breaking the rules of uh, Jenna Mills? No, you there? can go, you can go as long as you, as long as you quarantine. Or, oh, or you can get a test. Or you can get a test, yeah. I see. Did I tell you that she went to Kobe for a couple of years? No, she didn't stay there. <laughs> yeah, she was uh, she was there for two years, and then I don't know where she went after that. But yeah, so it's the only governor I've ever met in my life. In her pre-governor days. I have to look it up now. Yeah, it's from Farmington. Yep. She didn't come to our 50th reunion, but oh. I'm, sh I'm, sh I'm sure she was, uh, well, I know she was invited, but I don't know where she finished school, but maybe do Maine, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. So, so she went briefly to Colby before moving to San Francisco, and then she met, later went to UMass Boston. There you go. And then New Maine Law School. I think she was at Kobe for two years. She had to be, uh, I wouldn't have known her because I didn't go to Kobe till I was a sophomore, so. Oh, you did the opposite. Yeah, I got transferred. Yep. Well, I'm guessing we're not going to have any other folks because I'm not hearing from Andrew or Deb. Oh, wait a minute. It says, yes, he lost track of time. Hang on, maybe he's going to join us. Are you outside? Am I outside? Yes. Um, I'm uh, I'm on my porch, which is enclosed. Okay. The windows are open. Okay. The windows are open. The windows are open and the, uh, the windows are open and the fan is on. That must be what so we're it's... hearing. Yeah. Why are you getting songs or something? I am. I can I go back hearing... inside. No. <laughs> I was just trying to figure out, I was looking at everybody and I'm like muting them and unmuting them. I'm sorry, I think it might be you. There's Andrew. It's pretty, it's pretty quiet actually, so I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. If there's, if there's a noise, I don't know what you could be hearing, but. There he is. All right, we have a quorum at 714. <laughs> okay, so we get started. Um, so, I guess the first thing on the agenda is to approve the minutes from July 20th, our last meeting, but we're going to skip that for now. <laughs> because Amy sent you the June minutes. It's okay. No worries. We can move on to the um, direct, or no, the financial update. So, um, so I think I told you in July that um, our budget um, is all set and where um, everything's going forward. There's really, I, I gave you the um, 
I sent along the uh, spreadsheet with the with the general payments. Our payroll is exactly on budget. Um, our expenses are fairly normal. We always start the year off with a whole bunch of uh, annual and renewal payments that sort of get started and then takes a dip in the middle of the year and then towards the end of the year, we start ramping it up again. Um, the only thing I think that was really of note on the finances is that we did receive a $500 gift um, that was donated by a descendant of Grace Josephine Abbott. And she was a librarian or she worked at the library from 1908 to 1949. I believe it was Eileen Barrett, the local history um, librarian who helped find some information uh, for her about Grace. And so the donation came in and it will be applied to local history and preservation. So it was a little unexpected, um, but it was nice. It was, it was great. Wow. It's a big gift for a little help. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any questions about the financial report? Uh, we have not closed fiscal year 20 yet. Um, that the town accountant does that sometime usually in late August or early September, um, just to make sure there's no outstanding payments or anything. Um, so we're kind of just making sure that nothing gets expended against 20 and making sure everything gets expended towards 21. Mm -hmm. So pretty standard. Makes sense. All right, so I guess if there's no questions, we could move to the director's report. Yay. Okay, so um, the first part is library services and COVID uh, response updates. Um, the state is still in phase three and um, with the Board of Health approving us to have people in the building according to phase two or phase three, um, we, we gave ourselves uh, quite a bit of time to get ready to have people in the building once we got that approval. Facilities has been in and um, they have been stale, what they call Lexan, it's like plexiglass or acrylic, it's just a really nice quality. They have shields installed all around all the public service staff and they are now all working back at the schools. So we were, we were very lucky to get um, facilities work done uh, over July before they started ramping up for the school. There are some additional uh, safety equipment um, pieces that I, I really think that we should get. Um, and uh, I think we have, um, it's, I mean, it's tough to say, like some of it could be COVID and emergency COVID, but it's also kind of looking forward to the fact that some of this may be just how we have to do business for quite a while. So um, there, may be, there may be some investments that we can make here. Um, going forward, we're hoping tentatively on the 24th to be able to start having appointments by res or reservations or appointments for things like picking up materials inside the building, for reference questions, for uh, PC use. Those are all permitted under phase three. But to make the building as safe as possible, um, there are some things that we'd really like to get. Um, automatic hand sanitizer dispensers. Right now, we have a bunch that are on the um, that are on the um, on the walls. You know what I mean? They're they're and you have to pump them. Um, facilities does not have, or, nor do they particularly plan on having uh, purchasing any of the automatic ones that are battery operated or power operated, where you just put your hand under it. They're uh, they're not too expensive, but I would recommend getting. Um, three of them and having them one inside the door, one and um, probably on the second floor and um, a third one in another location to be determined um, where we feel like there's gonna, gonna be a lot of people walking, um, passing through or a high, you know, probably near self checkout or something like that. Um, I don't think we need to install them all over the building. There are the pump action ones available as well. Um, rolling, and there are some pictures in your handout on the last page of the like the hand sanitizer dispenser. Um, there's a rolling clear, clear acrylic shield. So this is like a, a it's 72 foot, so it's six foot high, it's about three feet wide, and they're on wheels. And basically.
actually there, you can roll them and you could, it could be like a divider. Um, the main space that we're looking to put these in are places like the children's room where you might have a table about six feet away from another table, but we still wanna have some sort of delineation between the space. Um, the idea of having it movable and mobile is that, you know, we can reconfigure the space at any time. We could also use it in the children's program room, or we could use it, we could, we could move them around. So we like the idea, the, the, the left-hand shields installed by facilities are like glued in. They're not, they're not drilled in, but they're, they're not going anywhere. We can't lift them up and move them someplace else. So we wanted to get several of those. We also wanted um, eight, eight of those. Um, desk shields. These are smaller shields that would sit between. So if you can think of the self checkout station on the main floor where there's two self checkout stations, if you just simply put a, an acrylic partition in between of those, it doesn't have to be permanently installed. Um, again, it would be um, removable at any given time. We could use it in another location. We could use it on a table um, where two people might be working. We could use it to separate that space out. Um, for all three floors, um, we recommend about 10 of those. Uh, desk shields. Um, if you can think about um, in the reading room and on the main floor where we have our computers, those are two desks that are ganged together face to face. And what we want to be able to do is put a shield between those. Now, ideally, we would not have two people working back to back. It would be sort of like one person would work for two hours, then their reservation would be over, and then someone would sit on the opposite side at another time, which would allow us time to clean. But just because there would be cleaning and there would be moving and there'd be interaction, we'd still want to have that divider there. Um, so it's not to necessarily to increase the number of people in that space at one given time. It's just so that we can have the space, but also have the flexibility to clean or work with it or shut it down for some reason. So there would be eight units for that. So again, these are like those, those groups that are getting together. We consider trying to separate all those desks. Those desks are very specifically arranged though, so they can have access to power. Um, so once you start moving those desks, you've lost the access to power. So people working with laptops or needing to charge their phones, now we're dragging cords all over the place. So it does seem, uh, plus some of them are actually kind of screwed together. So it's difficult to separate them. Um, student desk shields. Um, and there is a picture of those. Those are almost like little boxes that you sit in. Um, they're recommended for, for student desks. We would get them the maximum height, which is 23, 23 inches high, I believe. Um, and they come around in front of you and on the sides. Um, that is something we could see using in some flexible study spaces. So for example, um, if we were to use the community room, which has a maximum, we're anticipating of 12 people in it, we could set up 12 single study stations. It doesn't have to be for a small child, it could be for an adult. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be powered, those would truly be study stations. Um, but it just allows us to take a flat table or a segment, you know, like a desk or some sort of small table and just segment it out so that it's a single workspace. Again, those aren't permanently installed. We can store them if they're not in use and bring them back out again if we need them. And then the final thing, um, <laughs> oh, not the final thing, but one of the final things was a canopy. Um, <laughs> We just wanted to buy um, another couple canopies. They're not very expensive. We've been using the Reading Rec ones. We want to move away from using canopies. Um, we want to have people picking up inside. We know the weather is going to be an issue. Um, we definitely need to have them. And I could see how in the future, having just a couple of these on hand that we don't have to take back and forth or lend back or sign out from another town department would be, and then we kind of damaged one I feel really bad. Um, so if we're going to damage anything, I'd really like to be able to damage our own stuff <laughs> that we purchased. Um, finally, there is limited signage that we need to get. Um, the, the, those are very low expenses, but things like decals to the floor, getting laminated um, or printed up copies for signage for, you know, stop, wash your hands, here are the rules, wear your mask, those types of things. 
um, basically, um, I would lump that all under the same the same budget. So um, based on basic estimates of, of what we did on this, we're looking at between $6,500 and $8,000. Um, we do have gift funds, we do have state aid funds, we have the foundation funds. Um, it's just, um, you know, any of this could be cut in half, we could get half as many of everything and we could cut it down to $3,000. Um, we could double it, we could get twice as many. Um, so if you'd like to discuss or if you have questions about any of these protocols or thoughts and purchases. Um, I think it's important to get as many as you think you need mm -hmm. so that you can, as we can get more people in the library, you can maximize the number of people who can come in and not have to uh, fiddle around and say, oh, we got to wait three weeks or a month or whatever it might be to get more so we can, you know, have put more in the building. So I think get what you think you need. Okay, thank you, Cherry. Yeah, I agree, Amy. I mean, I definitely think um, whatever you and the staff thinks, you know, for for safety, I totally think it's a worthwhile, um, you know, investment of funds, definitely. Um, I wonder, do you think that, um, I'm just looking down at the picture, so that field is the one that's just like the, the one piece, right? The student one is like the, the box sort of thing? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think. Yeah, I think they look great. I mean, and I think we'll need them for a while. So I think that, you know, it's important to, you know, get them in as soon as we can so that, you know, there's no like back orders and things like that. I think it looks it's like a good plan. You know? Actually, I think the one thing that I noticed that might be a slow are those student desks, because I'm sure every school in America is now ordering some version of those student desks. Um, yeah. So. Um, and uh, I, I do think that, um, you know, if, if we can't, if we don't use them here all the time, you know, I, I'm pretty sure we'll find some uses for them. Um, I was thinking like, oh, this would be so great if we stuck some of these little desk cubicles in the children's room and we didn't let the kids playing Minecraft talk to each other. We're like, no, you have to keep your eyes on your own screen. It's not probably the best behavioral management system, but I was like, hmm, that's an idea for you. So. Um, I also I also have a feeling we're going to be using this stuff perhaps longer than we wish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, don't think so. this stuff is. I don't think this is going away anytime soon. I agree, Terry. I, we'll, I think we'll have these for at least probably through maybe even next summer or longer. Yeah. Yeah, and okay. I think we'll definitely get use. You know, even yeah. if it's post. Yeah. COVID, you know, for the fairs and all that stuff that we do a lot of outside, outdoors. So I think that's totally worth it. I uh, think that's a good time. Yeah, we'll, that is. we'll find ways to use them Definitely. even after. Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, that's all I had on the facilities and the, the specific um, building, building needs. Um, and I'll take that as we don't have to have a vote or anything. I just just to let you know, there you're going to see some invoices coming through that'll probably total between sixty five and eight thousand. I do if um, it doesn't have to be voted on unless you want to. But did did I, I think I did suggest something? Did I suggest? I lost my page. Page two. That's my page one. Did I suggest which? fund that it came from, or do you all have any preference which fund it comes from? Yeah, Meaning I like, we're gonna have a preference on which fund it comes from. Like state aid versus gifts or? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know if I have a, if I think that, you know, where it comes from matters too much. Amy, do you get a sense of like knowing how the budget usually goes through the year that there'd be a, a preference with one over the other? I mean, flat out, it's not gonna come out of our municipal regular operating expense, period. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty clear. So I think the next question then is, when I think about it is, um, we've always, I mean, I think one of the proposals I was supposed to come up with you is, a, a valid use for our state aid, which right now we use a lot for marketing. I think it's probably the best place to start because 
we already have a line that says, you know, equipment that, you know, the ha equipment that has to do with operations that are, you know, not, can't be funded through our um, regular operational expenses. So there's already a line item and I could track it fairly easily um, and just be able to run a report that says in fiscal year 21, these vendors, these amounts were spent on uh, building safety and health and safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I kind of feel like state aid, you know, um, also the auditors are often asking me why I haven't spent state aid. So, so yeah, maybe, you know, we turned it down. A little. I think it's at 39,000 right now. Okay. I say, you know, state aid might be a good, um, good use for them. Okay. Yeah, so I agree. I think it's a good idea. Well, this sounds like a state aid kind of, kind of expense, so. Great. I will do that. All right. Thank you for that guidance. Um, programs. Our pop-up library service is now on Tuesdays from 10 to 12. We've had two of them. Tomorrow will be our third one. They're very popular. They get filled. We're doing um, 25 registrations per hour. Um, and that's just, you know, people can kind of come in anytime through the hour. We're focusing on summer reading, but also we're doing bundles by ages. We have had a request to try and find some after work hours. So we're looking to see our, which evening we could add some pop-up services to as well. So th it seems to be going really, really well. Um, this week, tentatively, um, we have some printed home passes, I believe, that are going out. And Lauren's nodding her head, yes. Um, and we have a print service that's now available. These are what we call a soft launch. We're not advertising them particularly strongly because we just want to see how they work. But you should be able to um, order one of the museum passes or order a print, send, it, send us a print request. We'll print it out for you. And then we bring it out just like we would a regular item hold, something like that. So we're adding this. We're, we don't expect to have a huge number of um, takers on both of these services. So they're sort of a soft launch to see how we can integrate more reservations and more appointments with and how that affects our staffing. Um, all of it, curbside service, as well as anything that we do that has to do with delivering services outside the building takes twice as many people. So if not more in some cases. Um, so it's extremely labor intensive. Someone answering the phone, someone getting this, someone checking it out, someone, <laughs> someone checking the appointment, someone going out, picking, giving it to them, leaving it in their car, whatever it is. So we're trying, we don't want to overwhelm the, the, the staffing right now for that um, because we're also trying to do online virtual programming. Um, two weeks from today, tentatively, and I put tentative on everything, tentative, 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 is when we would like to have some inside pick, library pickup, limited computer use, um, the coupon and returnable passes, notary services, a shield if needed, uh, research and reader's advisory for all ages, and that includes the children's room, and study, reading, and workspaces, um, and those would all be by reservation. Um, and we would take walk-in reservations. The biggest concern with any reservation or appointment-based service is that if someone doesn't have the technology to make the reservation, um, we can, they can call us and we can make the reservation, but also we can um, take walk-ins. So if someone has absolutely no technology at their hand, if there's a PC available and they would like to use a PC and there's a PC, PC spot available, we want to have some sort of availability there because there, there is some barrier, there are some barrier issues to, to some folks um, who have some technology challenges. Um, but um, our, our first goal is to have the first and second floor services uh, spaced out. We've done capacity for every single space. Um, so for example, um, the children's picture book room has a maximum space, a maximum capacity of seven people. So um, that might be an appointment for a family of four. That might be one browser appointment and, you know, um, letting, we're always trying to leave one space for a page or for a library employee to enter this space. So we're trying to make sure that we leave plenty of space for that. Um, we're going to try and not open the ground floor until September, mostly because early voting is going on the last week of August. And that's just, we're expecting a stream of people using the ground floor. 
and then we'll reevaluate once September has come through. Um, there will be early voting again at the end of October as well for, for the, for the um, national election. Um, any questions about how we're going to be rolling out, cautiously rolling out our in library services? No, it seems like a good plan. Um, masks are required at all times. Um, and uh, even in workspaces, we're recommending them. Like if you're in a private office, you don't have to wear it, but we do recommend that you do wear it, or if somebody comes in, you both have to have a mask on. Um, anything on the public floor is automatically, or a hallway or a bathroom will be mandatory. We um, will most likely not have restroom services available because the maximum appointment time, I mean, obviously if there was an emergency, there's an emergency, but it's, that's one of the things that we're struggling with, particularly up in the children's room. Um, we may have to have some availability there, but that does greatly complicate the cleaning and whatnot of, of, of the facility. So um, appointments will probably be mostly less than um, either up to an hour, possibly computer use might be two hours, it depends. Um, we're checking to see what other libraries are doing. And all the other libraries are checking to see what we're doing. So we're all waiting around to see what everybody else is doing. It's kind of funny, actually. You might want to, you might want to make it, uh, I'll tell people that the restroom services will not be available. Yeah, no, I think we're going to plaster that everywhere um, because yeah. we just, we just don't have the staffing. Yeah. Right, Ex explain the reason why. So yeah. people don't think you're just being a jerk. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, but you know, just so they know that you don't have staff, you don't have, you know, you can't have people going in and out of the bathroom 500 times a day to clean up because somebody else went in there and touched the faucets. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, a I, huge burden. Yeah. And it might be a silly question, but when someone signs up for a reservation to like use a space um, in the library, do they fill out uh, like a pre-screening questionnaire no. or okay okay no uh employees do you can't okay. really ask the public um, yeah and it's a public building okay i didn't know how that worked with the public building because i know like if you go to like a dentist appointment or a doctor's appointment you do but that's different because it's like not a right building. so yeah i wasn't yeah i mean and you go to market basket you don't have to do that and they're not public i mean they're they're not a public either but so it's a it's a um there are we definitely have some limitations with public access um you know the state we're still waiting for the guidance on state because we're um you could nina you could make a reservation as mickey mouse but if you show up and you have mickey mouse's little receipt that says that you're supposed to be sitting at station b mm -hmm. then you can sit there so i mean obviously the privacy thing comes in direct conflict with um right our contact tracing issues, um, but it's a privacy issue. So, um, you know, that's why part of the reason that we're progressing so slowly because we're waiting to see what challenges come up, what the state comes up with. Um, and <laughs> I'm very cynical and feel like we're probably gonna be back at stage two or stage one by the time August 24th comes or rolls around. But um, yeah, so our goal is to start it and, and we're using a new um, part of related to our, um, we have a service that allows you to basically assign the seats. And one of the things we can do is start off by saying, oh, there's 20 seats, but only five of them are available. So we can start with those five and we can mark them out. And then if that goes well, we can say, okay, now seven of them are available. Or we could say all day Tuesday, there's none available. So it's a very flexible program. So we're, we're, we're kind of, we're very interested in making sure we maximize that. It also allows people to check in and check out of their program on their phone if they have it. Um, but we would need to have, um, this probably would fall under Michelle and Louise and anyone, the folks who manage our meeting rooms and things like that, all of those types of, of reservations. Um, we are gonna have to dedicate some staff time to managing this. Um, as well as, you know, there's concerns about, you know, dealing with the public and there's concerns with, um, you know, what happens if someone doesn't want to wear a mask? And so we've had those conversations. None of those have easy solutions, um, but, you know, we, we can say, um, we can offer them a mask. So I think we'll be offering, we'll have some on hand, um, but we are requiring, you know, we will have a sign that says masks required. So 
I'm not going to arrest anybody though, so. Um, okay, any other questions about services? Yeah, I was just wondering about um, the materials and the, the shields and all that you're ordering. Are people, would they be more comfortable? I mean, I don't know what the wait time is gonna be in fulfilling that order, but is that stuff that would make people more comfortable with opening to the public if it were available when? Yeah, we won't open. We won't open until we have them. Period. So um, it's possible. Yes, yeah, some of that stuff will be staggered in, but that's why, like, if we only are able to get half the shields in or half of the services in, then we'll only open up half of the appointments. So that's why we like the flexibility of this. Um, like I said, it's two weeks. So um, there's. Last time I checked on Friday, much of the stuff was on stock and would come within within a week. So. Um, but we have a lot of work to do before that before that goes. So that's why I really appreciated being able to talk about it tonight. Um, personnel, so non non COVID related, <laughs> we actually are up to twenty nine applications for our children's librarian positions. Wow. So we're hoping. Wow. I, know. <laughs> I think between yeah between layoffs and uh, furloughs and. Um, I mean, I'd like to think it was a good reputation as well, but it's a full-time uh, job. Um, so uh, we have candidates, you know, library, uh, people who are in library school. We have folks who are, you know, have years of experience, some people who have um, less experience. Um, I think there was at least one or two teachers in there. Um, so there, there's a team, it's, it's Olivia McElwain, McElwain, sorry, and Kate Zanino and Lorraine Berry, and they are working together to, find just the right person who will perfect that children's team. As you know, they always work so well together and it's um, a balance of experience and skill sets as well as just sort of kind of bringing that personality. Um, you know, we always think we can't replace that last person, but somehow we have always ended up with some really wonderful, wonderful people. So. Um, Susan Haggerty retired last week. Susan was a part-time uh, 20 hour a week library associate. Uh, we are currently filling those hours internally um, through a combination of existing employees. We do want to hire as we get into our Saturday rotations and things get busier and we need more people on the floor. You know, that, that's going to be really important um, that we do, but we just can't handle a higher <laughs> search right now. So we are going to have a couple employees, one Susie Axelson, who's going to go up from 10 hours a week to 20 hours a week. So she's going to take that benefited position. The balance of 10 hours um, is being spread out and we're covering it with um, our existing staff where she's taking on a little extra hours here and there. So um, it's not always the number of hours that someone works. It's sometimes the number of bodies that we're able to have in, in a building. So um, it's a very complicated, complicated formula. Um, we just finished up with Olivia Blumenshine with her internship. Um, it was probably like every other college student, one of the strangest summers to have a, a, an internship. Um, so I just, I just want to say that she was um, amazing to work with Olivia as a Reading resident. She actually just moved out of Reading, but she's a rising junior. She's starting her junior year at Washington University in St. Louis. I've known her for years and her family, and um, she was very anxious to work. Uh, she wanted to learn about the library, but she really wanted to do a summer project that had a, a an impact on the community. So we ended up working with this person named Carla Pinocchio, <laughs> who uh, works for the Reading Public School Systems. Carla, who is Nina's uh, parent, mm -hmm. or, uh, <laughs> um, is the head of the English Learning Learners Program at for the Reading Public Schools. She's the director there. And so she works, she covers all the schools, every student from K through whatever, if they need, um, you know, she evaluates them. Um, she makes sure that they get the help they need. She checks them on the families. It's a really, you know, she's got a great team, but Carla does a lot of it. So we had a lot of Zoom meetings with Carla. Um, the project that we envisioned back in February was totally scrapped. And um, we just kind of kept going, <laughs> going around and around. But we finally came around with a survey and Olivia did a survey, a print survey, and we also made it available online. It was available online in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Um, we got, uh, I just found out we got several back in paper, which we haven't collated. 
in addition to getting about 14 back um, online. So we'll probably have a total of 15 or 16, which is actually quite a good segmentation for that particular group. Um, so um, the project was twofold. One was to get a survey out, a fairly customized survey, a specific survey to this, to this audience. Um, to see how they view the library, what they think the potential, you know, what they're looking for in a community. One of the questions was, do you feel welcome in your community? Do you feel welcome at your schools? Do you feel welcome at the library? Um, yes, no, you know, yes, I agree, or no, I don't agree. So, you know, just kind of trying to get a sense of what, what their personal needs are inside and outside of the library. Um, so that was one part is to get some data. Um, and there is a, an, uh, an interest um, for many people on, uh, actually, um, more opportunities to uh, speak and learn and share their own native language and culture, which is wonderful, as well as um, citizenship exam uh, tools um, and things like that. So there, we, we got a lot of information out of that. Um, she also, I actually wrote down that she did four informational interviews. She actually did, Olivia did five informational interviews with five different librarians, which was pretty great. Um, and she also created this really wonderful, and Nina, you can back me up on this. Mm -hmm. She created this wonderful book called um, Welcome to Your Library, and it is told from Chumley's point of view. It's a picture book. Mm -hmm. And I think there's about 20 pages in it. Um, we're having them custom printed. Um, and uh, she found a, a place that, you know, it's much more expensive than buying it on Amazon or whatever, your, your James Patterson book, but a custom hardcover um, picture book. We are getting 10 copies in English, five in Portuguese and five in Spanish. Those folks who responded uh, will get a copy of the picture book. We'll have some in our library as well. But she also made electronic flipbook versions of this, which are just, they're just so charming. And mm -hmm. she left us with a to-do list. And one of the things she was saying is, you know, maybe we could turn it into like a video. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. I don't know, Nina, if you have any comments. It's great. It's really, it's fun to look through. And it's really cute how Chumley sort of like the, the star and the tour guide. But she did a really, really great job. And you can tell a lot of work went into it. I think it's great. So. Um, we did do an exit interview survey with Olivia. Um, we don't have a lot of interns, but um, I did one with the last one. And so now we have a population of two exit interviews um, to see you know, how we can make any experience for folks who come to work and volunteer with us, how we can make that better for them. Um, our goal is to obviously get people excited about working in libraries and serving their community and finding ways to support civic engagement. Um, I was, you know, looking back, I'm very pleased with how it turned out. It could have been an absolute disaster. We could have quit, but I think we got some really great work product and she had a really good experience. So that was great. Um, probably in the minutes that I didn't send you, I believe there <laughs> was a reference to you in the last meeting about asking about, you know, circulation of online versus physical. So in the collection update, I just wanted to give you a really quick snapshot. We are in the process of finishing our RS and starting our state aid and financial um, reports. It's pretty, um, you know, so we're all about data right now, at least I am. Um, I just wanted to give you a snapshot of some stuff. Um, if you look, uh, if you compare, if you're looking at a color version, the 2019 is in green and the 2020 numbers are in blue. Um, so clearly in March and then April, May last year, we had, you know, 30,000, 26,000, 25,000 in circulations for March, April, and May. April and May, we had zero. <laughs> there were no circulations. You see it's starting to creep up in June. Um, in July, we started to make some returns on our physical circulation, and we've only just started August, but we're actually, we kicked it off really, really well. One piece of information I did want to share with you is that um, Forty-six percent of our materials were adults. Eight percent that went out um, for just July. I'm sorry, these are just for July. These numbers: eight percent were teens, forty-five percent were children, and one percent was other. Which um, there's always an other. These are actually on par, almost spot on par with our normal circulation statistics. Um, this is almost so. Um, 
you know, I'm not sure what that says other than to say that uh, people are predictable, our usage is predictable, whether it's 30,000 or whether it's 8,000, we're still circulating the same proportion of those types of materials. For me, that's really helpful. And for Jamie, that's really helpful because that tells us where we need to spend our collection money. And this is, you know, the time when we're looking forward to see how we're going to build collections throughout the rest of the year. But I also wanted to give you the update. I know we've had questions and I've been talking a lot about how we have increased our online, particularly overdrive spending for digital resources and virtual resources. So um, it is up bonkers, um, you know, almost almost 100%. So what is that, 70 or 80%? July 2019, we had 2,800 or almost 2,900 digital circulations for overdrive. So those are eBooks and the downloadable audiobooks. In July 2020, it was 4,451. So significant, significant increases in that. Um, to me, that's more than, you know, we are definitely using the, the, all that extra money that you all approved to spend for our virtual digital collections. Um, so thank you for that. Are there any questions about circulation? We actually happen to have Lauren on the, on the line, so she could probably answer some questions if you have any. Okay. Okay. Strategic plan update. Um, so we had a different survey that our uh, consultant um, put out. We got 723 respondents, which is actually really great considering it was just a pure like digital marketing. We didn't have print copies. The last time we did this, we had print copies available. Um, we really pushed that, you know, we had them available at the senior center and town hall. We, you know, we did it, we, it was a lot more in the before times we would have normally expected to have closer to 900 or even a thousand respondents, but 723 is pretty good. Um, the consultant was actually really thrilled with that number. Um, and the town website and the town Facebook page and a couple other folks promoted it. So we were really excited about that. So um, we will be getting data back on that. They're processing, I guess, coding it. They're coding the responses now. Um, there will be three meetings. Uh, meeting number one will be August 27th. Um, as you know, as a board, we can only, it's really advised that we only have no more than two people at any of these events, um, just to make sure we don't break any open meeting laws. Um, I think Nina and Monette are, have volunteered to, to participate, but if you want to switch that out at any time, you can talk to your chair and vice chair about participation. But the first meeting is a broad group of community stakeholders. Um, there will also be library staff. The library staff are there to listen. They are not there to give feedback. Um, uh, this means, so this meeting will be about an hour and a half. and. Part of that hour and a half will be listening to information that the library staff will need for meeting number two. So rather than have to repeat the information to meeting number two, they're just all going to listen in on meeting number one. So they will be, the consultants will be talking about the strategic planning methodology. They'll be doing a trend presentation, probably a little bit from the survey, as well as some very high level presentation of some market um, demographics and stuff, information that they've done in research. And then they will have a feedback portion. Um, the target is to have about 12 community members, um, plus like the trustees and, and um, staff members. It's a difficult time to schedule. It's vacation time. Um, I originally scheduled it in late August because the school committee usually doesn't have meetings that late in August because everyone's getting ready for school. But now there's now the school committee and school administration have a meeting on the 27th. So best laid plans um, always get hijacked. So we're hoping to have about 12 community members, business, residents, some folks from the town, um, some different groups, um, some of the Rotary. So just a whole wide variety of people. And then meeting number two will be just library staff um, and trustees. And this will be a very in-depth look at our market, uh, market segmentation. They have done a primarily using our patron information uh, that was data blind, meaning they didn't get names or anything. They have some pretty intense um, market segmentation information that they'll be going over with us. Um, it is very in depth. If you're a numbers geek, um, 
it's probably pretty interesting. Um, they talk about penetration, which, which age groups, which economic groups, which geographic groups that we are making inroads, who, who are we not making inroads with? Um, the good news is, is that first I got to see a preview draft of this is that the library does phenomenally. We have the majority of the majority um, in our collective. So um, we, do, we do a great job. I think um, what this does is opens up those smaller, um, I think, I don't know if you'd consider them marginalized, but you know, people that, who are the people that we're not reaching? Many of them are very smaller specific groups that um, we can target. Um, you know, in, instead of trying to reach 2000 people, maybe we're right, trying to reach 200 people that fall within a specific market segmentation. So we'll learn all about that. The third meeting, which will be in September, will also be a couple of hours. Um, and that will be came from the second meeting and any of the community stakeholders who have the time or who are interested in, in coming back and participating. And it really will be sort of the sticking out kind of brainstorming, helping to focus on, uh, on the framework. And this will be the last piece of information that the consultants take back with them before they generate um, a draft strategic plan for us. So hopefully by October 1st, we have a draft strategic plan. That's the plan. Any questions about that? That sounds good. It's either a really great time to do this or, you know, I, actually I just think it, it probably is a great time to do this project because I, I think we're gonna have to look at what the ramifications of this, how this is really changing how we provide services. There's an article actually John Brzezinski sent along, I'll forward it to you about, you know, how, you know, libraries are about connecting. So if we can't do that in person, what are we doing? How do we, how do we trans, you know, how do we transmute that um, into to meaningful, to meaningful work in our community? Um, other than that, I'm just working on RS that should be ready by the September meeting. And I'm starting to do the financial aid application, the financial report, and that should be ready for the September meeting as well. And that's keeping us all busy. That sounds good. Sounds like uh, everything's under control, just <laughs> as I think, just as I think we all expected it would be. Yes, I agree. You guys, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. Under, under really difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. how, is, how is staff morale and are people looking forward to, or are they anxious about having the public back in or, or what is the, what's the general feeling? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, we're definitely, I think there's definitely anxious. I'm anxious about it. You know, I'm, you know, I'm worried about it. There's, there is no, um, every option, including the options that we're doing now, every piece of service that we do has an element of risk, right? So there's nothing that is completely risk-free, period. Um, so we, we, we walk in knowing that, and I think, um, we're trying to do our best to mitigate it. I think, uh, we're working with very closely with it. They're doing a really great job They're We're throwing everything at them. Oddly enough, one of the strangest things that we're having trouble doing are, is to try and figure out those places where they're shared phones. So, um, you can't have someone work a desk for 12 hours. So if someone's at the front desk and they answer the phone and they're off shift, you know, whether it's one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, somebody else has to use that phone. So we bought all these headsets that were supposed to go with the phone and IT got them and they plugged them in and they worked with them and the headsets didn't work with the phone. So somebody's returning them and everybody's getting their money back. And, um, but that's a difficult hurdle <laughs> because now we're like, well, can we just wipe them down with alcohol wipes? How do we switch that out? Can we forward them to people's cell phones? So there's little things like that where it's normally not a problem, um, but people are having to come very much in close contact with or share equipment with other people. That when we, that stymies us. Um, I can have people stand out line outside and they'll stand on their dots and most people are really good about that. But there are just some things physically in the building doing work. Um, handling materials repeatedly. Um, luckily, we're in the best building in the town. We have sinks on in multiple locations on all the floors. 
we have we can prop you know we crack all the windows it's a big space it dumps you know 100 percent of the air comes in 100 percent of the air goes out we can control that flow they've upgraded all the they've upgraded all of the stuff um for the um for the we call them filters are all are all updated so i do think that now that we're back to a regular-ish schedule um people are a little more relaxed um there were people who used to work only 20 hours a week and they were being asked to work 30 hours every other week and that's a shift for some people there are some people that were working 10 hours a week they were asked to work 30 hours every other week so um that piece of it i think has has, has eased up but so there's a little more normalcy in terms of you know, people shift, but it's still very anxious. Sorry, Alice, that's a long answer to a short question. Any other questions? I don't think I have any. Is there any anyone else or any other business that they need? I can't think of anything. Yeah. I think, like you say, Amy, it's going to be a real question of how I, how quickly we really go through these phases, and you know, there's new numbers all the time. Who know? I have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll do the best we can. Um, we're rolling it out, and you know, I'll tell you, I will say this, and and you know, Lauren can always correct me, but my sense is from the comments that we're getting, and I'm I'm not necessarily out with all the folks, but the emails and things that I get. For every person who's frustrated that we aren't moving faster, there's probably three or four, if not five people that are saying, look, thanks for doing what you're doing. Thanks for taking the care that you're taking. We understand that it's slow. Everything online is great. Thank you very much for just, you know, even trying and being there and being present and out there. So um, yeah, it's, you know, we all wish it could be better. We all wish we could change it. But um, as much as people were, I think, itching to get out and dine at a restaurant, not that I have, but, um, you know, I think people were excited to do social things. And even though the library is a social thing, I think they are saying like, okay, now it's a functional thing and you're getting us to functional things as quickly as you can. Um, so I feel like there is an appreciation and understanding from that. Yeah, I think everybody knows that you can't do what you used to do and you have to do things, you know, in a phased way so it's safe yeah and i think one of the big things we're going to look to this fall is how we can support the reading public schools um with their hybrid model i mean i don't know how we can we are only one building so obviously we can't take the other half of the kids and just bring them in the library or anything but no. um tutoring um you know i don't know if we're gonna you know we're gonna have to look at our tutoring you know we can't police tutoring um but you know we can have work pods you know we can have spaces that are you know reserved for two people or three people or single study spaces so we'll have some variations of that um primarily looking at study spaces this also goes not just for in public schools but college students who might be at home and need a place to study for two hours so we are looking at how we can support um education at all levels you know um as a space with, with, the, with the square footage that we have. Yeah. I think about. Lots and lots. Okay. So if there's nothing else, do we have a motion to adjourn for the night? So move. Second. Second. Okay, so I'm just gonna, just to take the vote, I'm just gonna go through on my screen in order that I see you all. So, Andrew? Uh, uh, yes, adjourn. Alice? Yes, Julia. Cherry? Yes. And I say yes as well. So I think that's all of us. <laughs> all right, Thanks. everyone. Thank you. Great. Have Thank a good take day. Care, yep. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Yep, bye-bye. Stay safe.